People always talk about the hot composting is so much better because it gets rid of these pathogens. But you and I both know that our gardens are, are covered in all kinds of bacteria, microbes, and pathogens. They're everywhere. I mean, just because you, you take your tomato plant at the end of the season. Composting. Uh, in your book, you talk about, and I, I did a, a kind of a video on this a while ago, but it's certainly not as comprehensive as the discussion in the book. Um, composting, you talk about five different ways to compost uh, and, their, and their various merits. Um, so uh, yeah, how about we talk about that a little bit? Because that's, that's a good way to get organic matter, a good, good way to you know, process things down, especially table scraps and that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, generally anytime you can get any kind of organic matter in the garden, it's, it's a good thing, right? Yes. As long as you don't overdo it. And any of the methods do work to some extent, but there are certainly differences. Uh, the traditional composting where we pile it up into a six foot pile is what we call hot composting. So we, we want that pile to be really good and hot to speed up the process, which is very important in cold climates. But that high temperature also tends to get rid of pathogens. And that's a second reason. And it even gets rid of seeds. So it cleans up that compost. The problem with hot composting is that uh, it, it almost becomes a hobby in itself, okay? You, you have to be very careful of the ratio of materials you put in there. And people talk about the browns and the greens. And uh, I've heard that for years. And then when I really started to understand what composting is, I realized it has nothing to do with browns and greens. I mean, the color isn't the important thing. Um, it's the ratio of carbon to nitrogen, right? So what happens in composting is that we have a bunch of organic matter and bacteria come along and they eat that stuff. Well, for bacteria to, leave, to live, they need two main things, carbon and nitrogen. And they need those in a ratio that works. And the ratio turns out to be about 30%. So they, they want a ratio of uh, carbon to nitrogen of about 30. Actually, that's not a percent, it's, it's a ratio. So 30 times as much carbon as nitrogen. If that ratio is out of whack, the composting doesn't work because the bacteria can't digest it properly. So when we're talking about browns and greens, we want to get that ratio correct. And if we get it right, then the compost pile heats up very quickly. The bacteria get to work and they grow like crazy and they start degrading all of that. If you don't get the ratio right, then you will still make compost. It's just going to be slower and it will be cooler, which means you don't kill off the pathogens so much and you don't get rid of the weed seeds quite so much. But it still makes compost and it's still for the good for the garden. Right. The other way to make compost is, is sort of a lazy man's compost. You just pile some stuff up and don't worry about it. And in the fall, yeah, that, well, that's me too. <laughs> in, the, in the fall, you know, we have a lot of leaves. Okay, well, leaves are very high carbon, very little nitrogen. So we pile up the leaves and what happens? Well, in our climates, which are my zone five, so it's fairly cool. Nothing much happens in the wintertime. The leaves are all still there in the spring. And, you know, they slowly decompose over the next summer and so on. And the reason is that there's not enough nitrogen there. And usually the pile isn't big enough. The, the size of the pile is important to get the heat going. But it does make compost in a different way. And what happens with a high carbon material like leaves is we get the fungi coming in. And the fungi start digesting those leaves and make something that we call leaf mold, which is just degraded leaves. Okay, But that's also good for the garden. The pieces are smaller. We can uh, layer it on our gardens. It does add organic matter. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, there's nothing wrong with being a lazy composter. Uh, the other ways are uh, vermicompost is one. So in vermicompost, is you get yourself some special vermicompost worms, you put them in a bin, some container, and you feed them every couple of days and you put your scraps in there. And the worms slowly turn this into worm poop. 
Now, what I found interesting is that this really isn't a composting process, even though we call it vermicompost. What the worms do is they want to eat microbes. They actually eat bacteria as their main diet. They only eat that rotten apple because it happens to have a lot of bacteria on it. They don't want to eat apples, but they eat that and soil and whatever else you throw in there to get at the microbes. And their digestive system is designed in such a way that they actually grind that stuff up. So when it comes out, it doesn't look like an apple, but we really haven't started the composting process yet, not on a chemical level. So the vermicompost, which is the poop that the worms make, is good for the garden. And you can certainly use it for that, but it's not true compost. And again, that will degrade over a long period of time. Uh, the other one that's very popular is Bokashi composting. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, that's not composting either. I have a lot of people recommend that to me. Oh, you should do it because I, I have a problem in my backyard where, you know, it's uh, black bears and raccoons, all kinds of animals. Yeah. And, and so Bokashi is sort of ready made in a sense because I can have it in a sealed container in my garage indoors and just periodically maybe bury it in the soil or whatever. But uh, yeah, explain what that's uh, all about. So Bokashi is really a fermentation process. So we take um, kitchen scraps again, but in this case, we can also put in meat and cheeses and so on. And meat and cheeses and milk products are things you typically don't put in the compost because the bears will come by. <laughs> so, we, and uh, if you don't have bears, well, you probably have rats. So yeah, yeah. we keep it out for that reason. So, but in Bokashi, you usually do it in a container and it's a fermentation process. So it's more like making wine or pickles. So we put the stuff in, we add some Bokashi mix, which is usually a bran with some um, bacteria on it to get the thing started. And we wanna create an acidic environment, very much like making pickles. And we leave it in there for a few weeks and it ferments, it doesn't compost. So if I put a cucumber in there, at the end of the Bokashi process, it's still a cucumber. <laughs> now it's soft and squishy, but it's still a cucumber. So we know that we haven't actually done any composting because we can actually see that we haven't done that. So now what do you do with it? Well, you, you can put it in your hot composting pile or you can take it out and bury it in the garden or spread it around. And it does seem to degrade quicker once it's been processed, once it's been fermented, but I actually can't find any data on that. <laughs> so I, I don't know if a, a, you know, a composted cucumber degrades faster than a Bokashi cucumber. Can't find any data. Right. Now in North America, this is a fairly new process and most people who do it, do it in the house. And that is another advantage. So you keep these bins under the sink and you just throw it in each time you have some, particularly nice in the winter because you don't have to go running outside to your compost pile. But in other countries, in developing countries, they do these in big piles and they usually start with manure. So right. they take the manure and whatever other organic matter they can gather together. They put the inoculant in there to start the process. And so they ferment it outside and in, in these big piles. Uh, and so on a global basis, actually a fairly popular method is, is just not done in gardens in North America very often. I see. So uh, that's Bokashi. And I think it's great for people who have a small amount of material. I think it's great for people who want to do it in the house. I think it's more pleasing to most people than having a bunch of worms under the kitchen sink. <laughs> so that's a, that's a plus. Uh, the, the last method I think is what I call the field composting or what I call the lazy man's composting. Yep. That's really what I do in that's the garden most yeah. of the time is I just leave stuff on the ground wherever it happens to fall. Yes. Uh, if I'm cleaning up the garden or I'm deadheading or anything, I just kind of pitch it on the ground. Or if I'm having visitors, I'll pitch it behind a plant so you don't see it quite so much. <laughs> but I just let nature do it. And, and that works just as well. It's a little slower, uh, but it works. Yeah. Now, this, this business of uh, pathogens and getting things hot, I, I'm not sure how important that is anyways. 
um, people always talk about the hot composting is so much better because it, it gets rid of these pathogens. But you and I both know that our gardens are, are covered in all kinds of bacteria, microbes, and pathogens. They're everywhere. I mean, just because you, you take your tomato plant at the end of the season and, and put it in a compost pile so you don't have a disease doesn't mean it's covering the soil and, and your stakes and the pathways and everything else. I mean, the pathogens are everywhere. So I'm, I'm not too convinced that that's a value. We got we to gotta make gardening simple. Yes. And too many things in, in the gardening circles try to make it really complicated. Yeah. And a lot of this is, is really quite simple. So when we look at, at composting, it's, it's really a rotting process. And, and all of these have slight differences, but in effect, they're all the same thing. Yeah. And I do have people online who say things like, oh, the vermicompost is, is so, so good. It's so much better than anything else you can get. And we have to understand what happens here. If I take an apple, it, it has a certain amount of nutrients in that apple. It doesn't matter if I put it in a compost pile or a bokashi bin or my dewworms eat it. The amount of nutrients in there, the amount of carbon, is not increasing or decreasing. Right. It's exactly the same in whatever process I do. You cannot take an apple and process it somehow and end up with more nutrients than you started with. Yes, yes, right? yes, yes. Now yeah, you yeah. can change the speed at which things are released, right? So uh, it's possible that a dewworm will eat the apple and what comes out the other end may compost faster than something out of a hot compost bin. Yeah. But it's also quite possible that it's slower. Yeah. Okay, we don't know. I've never seen a study that actually looked at that. No. Right? Same with the pokashi. I don't know if a fermented apple decomposes faster or slower. Mm -hmm. What we do know is we're talking years. We're not talking weeks. So whichever method you use, you then put it in the garden and over the next five years, <laughs> more or less, you're getting nutrients for the garden. Yeah. That's, that's why we do it. Well, and I've often thought, because people are often making the suggest, like the, you have to do vermicomposting uh, composting because it does this, that, and the other thing. And for me, like if you're, if you're field composting, there's worms and a million other things working on that. You're, yeah. it's still vermicomposting is it's going in one end of a worm coming out the other <laughs> then going into something else and coming out. I mean, it's, it's still like, wh why do I need to, why do I need an intermediary worm stage when I can, now I was just going to mention too, uh, last year I did an experiment where, so normally when I grow corn, I, I pull all the corn and I throw it on my lawn and mow it and <laughs> then, then put it back on the garden. And uh, I had a, 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 a Keith Reed on last year. He's a soil scientist. And he's saying, why, why don't you just throw it on the garden? Why, why are you doing all this work? Why don't you just let it lay there? So last year on the garden bed where I planted my garlic, I covered the whole thing with corn stalks. And it's, they're all gone. There, there's like, I noticed yesterday, there's like one or two, because they must have been like up high off the ground in contact, yeah. right? But basically they all disappeared and yeah. I didn't do anything. And I mean, I got real value out of those because it was basically a, a, a crop I grew last year and that, that crop provided uh, a mulch layer for my entire uh, uh, garlic crop this year. Um, so, I mean, it, it worked out. The fact that it broke down slowly wasn't a bad thing because no. uh, it continued to cover the soil and prevent evaporation, all that sort of stuff, right? So, great. And you weren't running your lawnmower. <laughs> I wasn't running the lawnmower, exactly. Which is a good thing. I know, <laughs> exactly. <laughs>